Welcome, and thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Meg Balistrieri, Project Manager with Tricom Funding. As a financial solutions provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member in the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, Tricom was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenter today is Tom Erb. For over 20 years, Tom has specialized in talent solutions for companies in a variety of industries, sizes, and types. As an executive for two of the largest staffing and recruiting companies in the country, he has worked with some of the most recognizable and well-respected companies in the United States. In 2010, Tom formed Talent Resources a consulting firm that helps organizations maximize their talent return on investment through better recruitment, selection, onboarding, and retention processes. As a recruiting expert, Tom has presented at the American Staffing Association, National Association of Personnel Services, and TechServe Alliance National Conferences. Tom is president of the Ohio Staffing and Search Association and past president of the Human Resources Association of Central Ohio. Talent Resources is a consulting, training, and coaching company focusing on the staffing and recruiting industry with the expertise and proven track record of success needed to help their clients grow their business. Hiring the right salesperson can be the most important challenge a staffing firm must overcome. A primary role of a staff salesperson is to meet an, in, the income and revenue goals established by your organization while maintaining a level of professionalism and integrity that fits the culture and brand of your staffing firm. By the end of this session, you'll know how to recruit and hire the best salesperson for your staffing firm. If you have questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there'll be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. With that, I will turn the floor over to Tom. All right, thanks, Meg. Appreciate it, uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're, what we're going to talk about today is, I think, the one of, if not the biggest challenges that staffing companies have. I hear all the time, and I work with a lot of different staffing companies on all sorts of issues, but one of the things that I hear from them over and over again is, I just can't find good sales reps. And what we found is that, in most cases, there's a lot of work that needs to be done before you even get to the point of posting a job. And that work typically is, is not done. And then even after the, the, the job is posted and you start to get candidates, how do you go about selecting the right sales rep? So we're going to talk about that. And uh, I would love to have questions as we go along. So pe please feel free to, to do the text uh, like Meg said. And so we'll just uh, jump in. Let me see if I can get this thing to work here. All right, so um, let's start by talking about how most staffing companies hire sales reps. And I've seen this over and over again, that it seems to be the same process. It's they wait until there's an opening, you place an ad on a job board, then you wait for the resumes to come in, you select the best for you to interview, and then you end up hiring the unemployed person that they like the best. And, and I might be a little bit facetious with that last part, but I, I will tell you that I'm involved in a lot of hiring processes with staffing companies, and most of the time, because of this process that they use, the person is not working uh, or is leaving a job. And so that's not necessarily a bad thing. We're not saying you can't find good people that are unemployed, but what it does is it limits you. When you consider that only about 4% of professional workforce is unemployed at any given time, you're talking about ignoring 96% of the workforce. And I guarantee that there are really good people in that 96% that we want to talk to. But the reality of it is, is that when you're talking about posting on job boards, the, that you're getting primarily people who are out of work as well as active job seekers, people who are wanting to get out of the situation they're in, so they're actively responding to jobs. So what we're going to talk about is what do we want to accomplish before we 
go out and start looking for somebody? What do we do if we're going to post a job? And what else can we do to go out there and attract the best talent? So we've identified that there's really five elements um, that allow a salesperson to be successful. And the first piece of that is what we're going to spend the most time on here today, which is recruiting the right sales rep. Sales rep. If you don't recruit the right sales rep, uh, the rest of the things really don't matter. It's kind of like being, it's kind of like having a NASCAR team and having the right car and the right pit crew and and the right ownership and all the money and all the resources, but you've got the wrong person in the car. You're, you're never going to get that person to the point where they're winning races. And the same thing with a sales rep. If you don't start out by recruiting the right sales rep, it really doesn't matter. Uh, how good the rest of the process is. So that's the foundation, and that's what we have to work on. But we also have to have effective goals for that person. We need to know what, what success looks like, and they need to know what success looks like. You need to have compensation that is tied to the company goals. Many times companies have compensation that actually is in opposition to company goals. Maybe you're trying to increase gross profit percentage, but you're bonusing somebody based on revenue that they bring in. Then you need to have ongoing training and coaching to keep that person at the top of their game and, and to continue to have them be the best in the industry. And then obviously you have to have service delivery on the back end. You have to fill the orders that they bring in, which is a common challenge as well. So why do salespeople fail? There are lots of reasons. And they are a combination of personal uh, competencies and traits that the salesperson has as well as just organizationally, are, is the organization set up to support this person and allow them to succeed? And I'm not going to go through all of these, but what I will say is that on the personal side, you can see that there are a lot of different characteristics that we should be identifying in the selection process. So even though that may be a personal trait of that person, we, as, the, as somebody that is hiring them to be a salesperson, should be identifying that in the process ahead of time, and we should know what to look for. And we should have a very good idea of what an ideal sales rep is going to be, and we should be recruiting as close to that ideal as possible. You know, it's expensive to have a failed sales rep, and any of you that have had sales reps that have not been successful know this. It's, it's painful. There are lots of different costs to this. There are uh, recruiting costs, obviously. That, that's, a, that's a hard cost that goes into recruiting a salesperson. Compensation and benefits while that person is working for you, even if they're not generating any kind of income, you're still paying them. Onboarding costs. What does it cost for, the, for you to, to uh, onboard them and to train them, to have others work with them so that they're not being productive, they're instead working on onboarding and training this new salesperson, and if you have a revolving door of sales reps that aren't succeeding, you're doing that over and over again. I think the biggest cost is opportunity cost. If you're constantly going through sales reps and you're, you're bringing in a sales rep which has a certain ramp, uh, it's going to take a while for them to be productive, and they don't make it to that point. Then you start over again. Then you have to go through the recruiting process again. Then you have to bring them on, and then you have to wait for them to get up. And so one bad hire can put you behind a year, a year and a half to full productivity. And I have a graph that I'll show you in a second on, on what that does to your business. Travel and entertainment, they're going out there and they're spending money on stuff, but they're not generating any income. Other expenses tied to sales reps. Technology expenses. The potential for lost clients and prospects. You know, the, the turnover when you do have somebody that maybe is generating some activity but not to the point of closing deals and generating revenue. In the meantime, so all of that can be lost because you have to go out and find a new sales rep and there maybe isn't somebody who can, can pick that up and run with it. And then service team morale after a while gets impacted by this because they keep saying, well, we just keep going through sales reps. We're new, you know, we don't have enough orders to fill because we don't have sales reps that are bringing in those orders. So what's the value of a sales rep. What's the difference between an, a low performer, an average performer, and a star performer? And if you take a look and you say, this is based on gross profit dollars, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor or not, but over here is, is gross profit, and this is 30 million up here, and down here is how many years 
that that person is working for you or multiple people are working for you. A low performer is down here in the green area. And if we take an average of, let's say, $150,000, they generate $150,000 in gross profit in new business a year. And I, I honestly think that that's probably being um, overly generous. You have to take into account that if they're low performers, you're going to have a lot more turnover. So, it, But if let's just say, for argument's sake, that $150,000 in new business. So you have $150,000 in the first full year. Um, and I can categorize new businesses every 12 months. So then the second year you have 150000 in old business uh, that they generated the previous year plus another $150,000. So it does build on itself. You have an average performer that generates $300,000 in gross profit. And that's pretty well an, an industry standard. It's what I've seen over and over again is that typically a quota uh, is somewhere in that $300,000 gross profit range and it varies a little bit depending on the market and depending on skill sets, but you can say about 300000 is about a quota. So I would say that an average to good performer is hitting quota on a regular basis. So that's 300000 And then a star performer, if you have them generating $500,000 a year, which is not unheard of for a really high-performing sales rep, you can see the difference. And what the difference ends up being is $10 million over the course of 10 years in gross profit between a good performer and a great performer, and 20, almost $21 million between a great performer and low performers, which most likely you're talking about in 10 years, you might have five, six, seven low performers. And that gap could be even greater. So it's, it is a huge, huge decision uh, when you're trying to figure out what sales rep that you're going to hire. So what you need to ask yourself before you even get started are some key questions. First of all, what does sales success look like for my staffing company? So if this person is successful, what does that look like? How much gross profit dollars do they generate? Uh, what, what, is, um, what am I trying to accomplish by bringing in this salesperson? What would my sales rep need to do to reach our sales goals? And that is a combination of dollars generated as well as activities placements, what types of activities should they be doing, how would an ideal employee in this position act? A retail sales rep that's going after small onesie twosie business is going to have different activities than a large account salesperson is. So we need to take a good look at what this person is going to be doing because it's going to require different competencies. What am I going to do to pick the best person? So how am I going to measure them? How am I going, what questions am I going to ask, interview questions? What am I going to look at from a criteria standpoint when I'm evaluating resumes or LinkedIn profiles or, or other areas? How am I going to know that I'm picking the best person? And then lastly, where am I going to find this person? Where should I go out to and make sure that I'm getting the right person and that I'm casting as wide a net as possible? So step one is to define success. So we need to ask ourselves, what does sales success look like for my staffing company? Right? Um, so the things that you want to ask yourself are, what is our company growth goal? Uh, I've seen many times where, where companies will have a growth goal, and yet what they give the sales rep is either nowhere near the growth goal or it's more than the growth goal, um, or there are multiple sales reps, and if you add up all, the, all of their goals, they're – less or greater than the company growth goal. So you need to take that into consideration. What am I trying to accomplish? Because uh, that should be in sync with what the sales rep's goals are. What percentage of that goal should the, the sales rep have? Should a recruiter have or recruiters have? Should the manager have? What should they be responsible for? You also have to take into account the, the existing business. How much can we reasonably expect to lose? How much can we reasonably expect to grow? Those are the questions you need to ask. What types of activities should we be measuring? Uh, should we be measuring calls, appointments, placements, revenue generated? Uh, what I recommend is that early on when you bring in a sales rep, that you're measuring activities. You're measuring sales activities like phone calls, email interactions, not just blanket emails going out, but, but actual email conversations. 
uh, networking events. You should be measuring activity much more closely on new people because they have not gotten to the point where you can see success in the form of appointments and pipeline and, and uh, uh, revenue and gross profit generated. As that moves on, I place less emphasis on activities if they can prove to me that they're successful and that they've got that piece of it. What conversion ratio should we expect? So what percentage of their pipeline, of their opportunity pipeline, should they be closing? You know, industry average, from what I, from my experience, uh, is, is pretty consistently sales reps, if they have an accurate pipeline, they're closing about 20% of what goes into their pipeline. Um, what should be their call to appointment ratio or their activity to appointment ratio? What's their submittal to placement ratio if, if they're also placing people or if your recruiters are placing people? And on and on, there's, other, there's different ratios. And then based on that, you want to create activities that are going to help you achieve the overall goal. Um, we have a what we call a sales goals worksheet that allows you to work backwards from this. And if anybody wants that, they can, uh, they can reach out to uh, uh, Tricom, I'll make sure that, that Meg has a copy of that, or you can reach out to me after the call. So then step two is we want to figure out what their responsibilities are. And again, the responsibilities are going to vary based on the type of sales activities you want them to do. If you are going to have them go after small business, they're going to do a lot more uh, cold calling. They're going to do a lot more, uh, they're going to have a lot more weekly appointments. Uh, it also depends on how mature is the market? And are they inheriting a cold market? Are they inheriting a really strong database that they can start working on? Uh, are they coming with experience, with, with staffing experience? Do they have a non-compete that you have to, to be cognizant of and you have to, to not uh, violate? So all of those things you have to take into account. And these are just some examples of, of some of the things that a sales rep might have um, might be required to do. So, you know, prospecting, pipeline management, closing an account transition, and then a professional development. How do we keep uh, keep them at the top of their game? Step three, we want to identify competencies, and we want to um, we want to identify what the ideal profile of a person in this position is. And we break them down into really four different areas, the, the behavioral traits or, or competencies. The first one's relationship effectiveness. The second, and this is, are they a strong communicator? Can they build relationships? Are they confident? Do people trust them? Then there's sales effectiveness, and that's, you know, are they goal-oriented? Are they financially motivated? Are they competitive? All those things kind of tie in together. Under problem solving, can they solve problems? Can they can they figure out how to get into a company? Can they figure out how to move a process forward when it's stalled? Can they figure out how to navigate a company that has multiple people involved in it and has multiple layers? And, and then also being proactive as well. And then time management. Do they manage their time well and can they prioritize their efforts well? So I, I've kind of run through some, some quick slides. Meg, do we want to pause real quick or do, should I keep going? You can keep going. Okay, great. So um, from that, what we want to do is develop our ideal candidate profile. Once we get an idea of, of what these traits are, we also need to think about what's this person going to be doing. You know, are they going to be going after large accounts or are they going to be going after retail? Do they need to have that type of experience? very different sales cycle uh, between the two of them. And there's a much longer longer sales cycle, and the sales cycle is different. Sales process is different. Um, do you expect them to be more of a transactional, trans, uh, excuse me, transactional uh, versus a relationship salesperson? And what I mean by that is, are they going to be going out, bringing in business and moving on, or do you expect them to maintain some sort of relationship for, for a period of time? Some of the companies that I work with, they want them to be pure hunters, and they want them to go out, and they want them to grab business, bring it in, and go out and get more business. Some say, you know what, we want them to, to manage the business that they bring in. We want them to service it, and then many companies are, are somewhere in the middle. It really just depends on, on what your goals are. Uh, but you have to think about that because those are different skill sets. 
one of the biggest questions I get is, should they have staffing experience? Um, and I, I would say my answer to this, for, for my own standpoint, is ideally I'll get somebody with staffing experience because it, it certainly reduces the learning curve. If I can't find somebody with staffing experience, and, and by the way, I'm not going to limit myself to somebody with staffing experience because there are other great people that are in other industries. But the second tier that I'm going to go look for are uh, the types of companies and industries that sell to the same prospects that we sell to. So that could be um, background check companies, um, uh, EAPs, benefits, the, those different types of, of companies are who I want to sell to. People that are selling to HR, that are selling to manufacturing, accounting, IT, whatever is my niche, so I want them to, to sell to. And that also brings up, do they need to have niche industry experience? Uh, I think once you get into the point where you're really getting into, they need to have staffing in IT sales experience, you're really starting to limit yourself. And so I, I tell people that I think you should have cast a wider net than that. Sure, you would love to have somebody who's perfect that is – uh, IT staffing, and you're an IT staffing company, and it's easy because they can just kind of run, and hopefully they don't have a non-compete, and they can just kind of run with it. But the reality of it is that that's going to limit you pretty severely. Um, is it a cold market or is it a warm market? You know, there, it's if it's a cold market, you're going to need somebody that's going to do an awful lot more more cold calling, and they're going to have to do a lot more prospecting. So they need to have those skill sets and the willingness to have a lot of rejection, to pound the phones. They, they need to per, be persuasive and, and be confident to be able to, to really start that market off cold. Uh, somebody who has more of a warm market is going to have different skill sets. There's just going to be more of, of getting back into uh, organizations, relationship building, and moving the process forward. And then lastly, do you go the rookie or the free agent route? And what I mean by this is, you know, you've got in – in sports, in major league sports, football and basketball, you've got uh, you've got options of do you want to go out and get a free agent and pay them based on past performance, or do you want to go and get a rookie and pay them based on future on future potential? And companies go all different ways. I, I would say you want to get the best person available. And so you look at both. Um, you also have to take a look at how much am I willing to train this person, mentor this person, uh, how, much, how patient am I going to be for this person to learn the industry and sales and business, how sophisticated are, are my prospects and clients, uh, are they large accounts that are going to be very complex, they're going to be dealing with, with people at a very high level um, because that takes time for people to, to learn that. So you need to think about all of those things as well. Step four is how do we go through the selection process? And what I find is that most, um, most staffing companies don't really think through their selection process. They don't have a repetitive process they go through. And if you do, that's fantastic. You're, you're ahead of the game. Uh, this is what I recommend to my clients. And what we do is we start out with an ideal candidate profile at the top here. Um, then once we've really figured out exactly who we want to go after, it's much easier for us to start doing this targeted recruiting. And we'll talk about that a little more in a second. Once we start to find people, we want to do just a brief phone screen with them. Okay, We go through, we say, yep, they look pretty good on paper. Let's do a phone screen with them. That might be 15, 20 minutes just to see uh, are they good on the phone, do they have the basic um, essentials that we're looking for, any red flags, if that goes well, then we have a phone interview. And you can do a phone interview or you cannot do a phone interview as part of this process. But I recommend a phone interview because that's what they're going to be doing a lot. They're going to be on the phone. And you want them to call you. Don't call them. Don't make it easy on them. You want to see what they're like when they call in. How do they initiate the conversation? Are they comfortable calling in to you? And uh, that's when you go a little bit more in-depth into some of the things that, that you want uh, that you want to see, you want to know more about their background, those types of things. Then do an in-person interview with, with a different person, typically a different person than the phone interview. 
if they make it through that, then they go on, they do a second in-person interview with another person so that you're getting different, uh, all sorts of different perspectives and feedback from people. Then I recommend that you do a behavioral assessment. It's kind of your sanity check, and you can get a behavioral assessment for a couple hundred bucks that is, is it will save you in making a fifty, seventy-five, or a hundred thousand dollar bad decision. It's a good investment. Just consider it insurance. Um, but a behavioral assessment that takes a look at at um, what are the characteristics that you're looking for in the ideal candidate, and how does this person match up to that? Are they competitive? Do they have a strong work ethic? Uh, do they have attention to detail? Do they have good sales skills? Uh, do they are they are they uh, uh, are they strong when it comes to relationship effectiveness? Then you bring it down to final selection, and then you then you make the offer and you hire the person. So that's what I recommend is that you have a have a consistent process. I recommend that you have um, questions that are pre -pre already pre-made that everybody has access to that are consistent with that ideal candidate profile that you're utilizing. And otherwise, why have the ideal candidate profile? You certainly can allow people to ask other questions, but make sure that they're asking certain types of key questions that are, that are critical to the position. The other thing, step five, is you want to recruit wide. You don't want to limit yourself just to job postings on, on um, the job boards. And here's the reason why. If you take a look up here uh, at the very top, as I mentioned, about 4% of the U.S. Uh, talent pool, the professional talent pool, is unemployed at any given time. And right now we're running at about 6.2%, 6.3% total. But for professionals, which salespeople would be included, it's about 4%. To the right of that in the gray, you'll see at any given time about 9% of people working are actively looking for a job. So that gives you 13% of people that for the most part are on the job boards. You then to the right of that in the light green, you have what we call semi-active or, or the window shoppers. And these are the ones that they're not active yet. Their resume is most likely not on a job board. They're maybe occasionally checking out a job board, but not on a regular basis. They're looking at LinkedIn postings. They're, they've told their friends and family that they, they think they might be ready to start. They might have redone their resume, um, but they're not somebody that, that you're going to take your chances. If It's going to be hit or miss whether or not they're going to respond to a job posting. So then you have in the, the orange area, you have the biggest area, which is the passive candidates. And 37% of all, all people in the workforce are considered passive. Those, those are the people that are not looking. They don't have an updated resume. They're not looking at the job boards. But they would be open to listening if you had a compelling job offer. So if you take a look at this, and then you got 25% that just they're just not moving, whatever reason it is. They just started a job. They love their job. They, they're they part owner in it, or they own the company, or it's a family business, or whatever it might be. They're, they're just You're just not going to get them to move. So 75% of the workforce at any given time would be open to listening to your job offer as long as it's compelling enough. If you're placing jobs on job boards, you're only hitting 13% of it. So it's important that we hit other other areas. And these are just, this is not an exhaustive list. It's a pretty good list, but it's not an exhaustive list. What this is, these are different targeted recruiting activities. And you will see that the different columns are what type of candidate it is from the previous pie chart. You've got your unemployed, you've got your active, your semi-active, and your passive. The check marks, the dark green check marks, means you're probably going to get most to all of, all of that particular group by utilizing this type of recruiting activity. Um, the active, uh, or excuse me, the, the light green means you're going to get some, but not all of them. And then if there's not a check mark, it means you're probably not going to really, really get them too much. Um, now, unemployed, I probably could have put check marks on every single one of them, regardless, because the unemployed are very actively looking. And, and same uh, with the active job seekers as well. But you can see there's a variety of activities. I have highlighted several types of activities as what we found to be the most effective
for going after those semi-active and passive candidates. So you've got LinkedIn groups, LinkedIn job postings, obviously networking events. If you know who you want to hire before you need to hire them, then that's obviously the best scenario. LinkedIn and Facebook direct ads, and then LinkedIn and mails. You know, those are the ways that we have found for sales professionals that you have the best chance of, of reaching out and catching the attention of, of semi-active and passive candidates. So um, now that we've got to the job description um, or the job posting, there's a, a distinction that we want to make, and that is there's a big difference between a job description and a job posting. And we're in the staffing industry, so some of you are probably saying, well, yeah, that makes, that makes total sense, and that's common sense. Well, I can tell you from my experience it's not common sense that it, um, most companies, whether they're in staffing or not in staffing, take their job description and copy and paste it into the job posting. And so what we need to consider is that uh, a job description is internal. The posting is external. The posting needs to be a marketing piece. It needs to sell people on why they should consider this position at all. What effective job postings should have is, first of all, if they're creative, the more creative, the better. Um, you want to catch people's attention, and the studies have shown that creative job postings have a much higher response rate. You also don't want to focus so much on what the responsibilities of the job are but more you want to focus on what is the life of that person going to be like once they're in that position. How will their life improve? Will it improve because it's a, it's a more exciting job? Will it improve because they're going to have purpose in their, it's a purposeful job, um, that it's a great work environment, uh, that it's an established company, and maybe right now they're in a company that's, that's kind of unstable? So you want to think about what is it about your company and about your job that is going to be attractive, particularly to somebody who's happy in their job, but you still want to lure them away and have them come work for you. You want to be truthful. You want to be realistic with them. You don't want to say things that, that aren't accurate. You don't, want to, uh, you don't want to sugarcoat things. I mean, if there are challenges with it, then you say, hey, listen, this is a great job, but there are challenges with it. You want to let people know up front. And you want to just make sure that you give an accurate depiction of the job responsibilities once you have sold them on the opportunity. You do want to let them know what they're going to be doing. So uh, I have run through this very quickly. I would like to open it up for questions, and uh, I'm happy to answer anything that we have. I think we're at the end here. Yep. So I would like to open it up for questions, and, and uh, we've got some time to delve into things. So. Anybody who has questions, please feel free to, to uh, send them to us. All right. Thank you for that. Um, I do have some questions coming in. Um, we do have one to start. Do you believe sales reps should have a quota? And if so, how do you create one? Yep. Uh, so, um, Yes, I, I do. Um, I strongly believe in a quota. You don't have to call it a quota. You can call it um, you can call it a goal. Uh, but I I strongly believe that that all good sales reps want to be held accountable and they want to know how to measure success. And so I definitely recommend that you have a quota. And and you know for me a good rule of thumb is they should have a a ramp the first year. In quota, uh, they shouldn't. They typically shouldn't hit their full quota until somewhere between month seven and month nine or ten, depending on uh, depending on the market. You know, is it a cold or a warm market? Do they have staffing experience? Uh, are they are they seasoned or are they relatively new? You know, how long is the learning curve going to be? Um, and so, uh, if I were to select a, if I were to find a person that has staffing sales experience in that market without a non-compete that has had significant experience, I might have them get to full quota by month six, month five or six even. Um, and it also depends on the size of the deal because the, the larger the size of the deal, the longer the sales cycle. 
So, but I would I would typically have them probably be at full quota by month five or six. If I'm going more with the rookie uh, that doesn't have any staffing experience, is relatively new to sales, I'm having him go after smaller business so the sales cycles are shorter. Uh, I'm going to probably have their full ramp be eight or nine months, and then um, before they hit their full ramp, I probably am going to have zero quota on them for the first three or four months, and then I'll gradually start to ramp that up to full quota. Typically, you see full quota, I mentioned this before, a full quota would be about 25000 in GP a month um, is pretty standard for commercial staffing, um, a little bit higher for IT, accounting and finance, and other professional skill sets. Uh, and then a more seasoned one would have it be a little higher. A good rule of thumb that you can use is about four to five times their base salary um, for a for a quota. All right, we have another question. We use the DISC assessment. Is that a good assessment? We also use the Wonderlic. Uh, yeah, great question. Um, so I, you know, I'm I am familiar with DISC, um, and I've used DISC before for sales reps as well. I think DISC tells part of the story. I don't think it goes into enough detail. Um, I think it's good to use a DISC assessment. I, we use DISC assessments at a past company that I worked at more for uh, more for coaching and really for identifying what type of, of personality they had and how to manage them um, and how we could best support them rather than seeing if they were, from a competency standpoint, if they were good. Um, uh, if, if they were a good fit for a salesperson, if they were likely to be successful. Um, Wonderlic, I know Wonderlic has a variety of different assessments, so I'm not sure which one you're using. I, I'm not as familiar with that, but I do know that that is, it goes into a little deeper detail and is more predictive than I've found DISC to be. So that's, that's just my personal, um, that's my personal uh, opinion. We use one that's called People Best, and it, it it has 29 different traits, and uh, then it has a variety of different competencies that uh, those traits are made up of, and, and it gives you, for me, it gives it gives you a nice, well-rounded view of what their likelihood is. Are they a good fit for a salesperson? Okay. Um, what about the Rembrandt assessment? Have you heard of that one? I uh, No. Well, I haven't. I, I, I'm not familiar with it, no. Do you have any general advice about hiring someone whose personality and industry experience you are drawn to do sales has not done sales before? Can you say that again? Okay, sorry about that. Do you have any general advice about hiring someone whose personality and industry experience you are drawn to to do sales that they have not done before? Yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. I if I if I'm answering this right, um, I the the best sales rep that I ever had. She um, she was a rock star salesperson. She started out as a recruiter and had not done sales before, and she got into sales and and you know it took her a few years, but but she she got to the point where um, she was she was by far the best sales rep in the country for um, for one of the largest staffing companies in the US. So uh, absolutely, I think uh, personality, their their behavioral traits are extremely important to that. So I would certainly have them go through an assessment and I would have them go through a, a multiple step selection process with different people so that everybody can be on the same page. But um, uh, you know, absolutely, I, I think you can get somebody who does not have sales experience but has the personality and the behavioral traits and they can be successful as long as you have the resources and, and the patience to train them. Great question. Um, what are the behavior traits that you feel make a good salesperson? Uh, so, so we had a list of those. You know, I would say if I if I had to pick one, um, what I've seen is if I had to pick a single behavioral trait that is the best indicator of if somebody's going to be successful, it would be competitiveness. Uh, some, because somebody who is competitive 
first of all, they tend to be financially motivated because that's how they measure their success. Uh, and when I mean competitive, it's great if they've done some sort of sports, or they've, but it doesn't have to be sports-related. Uh, it can be an internal competitiveness. You know, I, I always like to ask people, do you consider yourself competitive and why? Um, and then let them talk about how they consider themselves competitive, and then can they really back it up with that? Uh, I just find that, that they really, that drives a lot of the other behaviors. The other thing that, that they need to be is they need to be credible. Uh, people have to trust them, and people have to, to believe in what they're saying. I, I've had some sales reps that have been, they've been great from the standpoint of they do the activity, they're driven, um, but at the end of the day, people just, they, they weren't real credible. And so it's, um, I would say those are two of the biggest traits, but there are a lot of traits that are, are important. I think people have, they have to be um, goal-oriented, um, which kind of goes to the whole competitiveness. Um, they need to be friendly, personable, empathetic. Um, those are all things that I look for as well. And, and I think when we go back and we talk about do they need to be relationship-based or transactional-based? Things like empathy and relationship building are more important if they're, if they're going after relationships. If you expect them to really develop relationships, they're not as important, but they're still important if it's more of a transactional sale. How do you evaluate competitiveness? Uh, how do I evaluate competitiveness? Um, you know, it's really based on, on questioning them and asking them how they are competitive. I, I, you know, I've had people who are, are competitive. What I'm looking for is inner drive. I'm looking for that, that uncomfortableness that they have with losing, um, the, the fact that they're always trying to get better. Um, they're always a, a little bit unhappy with where they are. They're always trying to, to just be a little bit better. Um, so I, I'm asking, them, like I said, I'm asking them questions about, you know, how are you competitive? Give me an example. You know, I'm big into behavioral interviewing. So give me an example of where you you competed for something and were not successful. You know, how did you how did you feel? How did you approach it? What did you do to to try and get better? You know, were you successful? Those types of things. What mix between base and commission do you recommend? It depends on the type of um, it depends on the type of um, uh, business they're going after. Um, it depends on what level that they're at. Um, if you're talking about more of an entry level business development person, more more of a a retail sales rep that's going after smaller business, they're going to tend to have a lower base. Um, uh, you know, and it, it totally depends on the market too. Uh, I typically like to see salespeople be able to double their base salary at least by hitting, uh, by exceeding their quota. So if they're at thirty-five thousand and they hit their quota, then um, they should be making about seventy. If they're at 60 and they hit their quota, they should be making, you know, 110, 120, something like that. And so that also you're going to want to kind of, kind of make their quota. Um, you know, they're going to need to make that um, uh, in proportion to that. Now, I would say that somebody who you're you're paying a higher base just because they have more experience uh, is not necessarily going to have the opportunity to double their um, their uh, total compensation. You know, some of it's just market based too. It's like you know, you're trying to hire somebody you think's really good, but they're at an 80 base. Well, you could probably get them at that 80 base, um, match that 80 base, but maybe their their commission's not going to be as strong as part of their overall compensation. Regarding your recruiter, you groomed into sales. If it took her a few years, did you keep her? Did you keep her quota levels low? How did you monitor her growth? Uh, well, let me. Yeah, it's a good question. Let me clarify that. It took her a few years to get to be the best in the country. Um, it 
it did not take her long to be a good recruiter and to hit her goals. So, uh, no, it's you want to have some patience on that. I mean, it's and that's the hardest thing I think for for managers and owners is to have patience, but also to know if that person is performing or not. Um, so you 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 are going to want to have somebody who like if I go back and talk about quota. Somebody who does not know sales is going to need an additional at least three months on their quota, maybe more. Um, and their quota is probably going to be a little bit lower than somebody who is coming in at a that, that has the experience. So you need to account for that learning curve. Um, and so I would say an, an extra three or four months on that ramp up. But no, we didn't. You know, we we didn't give her. A tremendous amount of additional time, but you also have to take a look at you know if you're giving somebody seven, eight, nine months to ramp up, you need to be measuring their sales activities. You need to make sure that they're hitting those. You need to make sure that they're hitting their appointments. They're they're hitting their pipeline numbers. You know I look at four things really. I look at sales activities, appointments, pipeline. You know what? How much should be in their pipeline from a revenue standpoint or a GP standpoint? Where what? Where are they in relationship to that? And then I also look at where are they percent to quota because it measures four different parts of the sales process. You know, the activities is is around prospecting. The appointments is is more around getting um, uh, moving prospects into your pipeline. Pipeline management is moving them through the sales process. And then the GP or revenue quota is the results of it. So somebody that you're going to have on a long um, uh, on a long um, learning curve, you're going to really need to make sure that they're hitting those activities, and then they're starting to hit those appointments as well. What should the breakdown between margin they bring in and their base and commission be? Um, can you say that again? What should the breakdown between the margin they bring in and their base and commission be? Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer this right, and if I'm not, just you know, text us some additional information. Um, typically, what I like to see is um, that. Their, their margin that they're bringing in is about four to five times their base salary. And their commission, typically what I'll do is I will create a commission plan that is tiered, and I will commission them at either little or no commission up to their break-even for the first tier. Once they've hit that, then in their second tier, they get an increase in commission percentage up to their quota. Once they hit their quota above that, then I really bump up their their commission percentage on that because that's just gravy. You know, if I'm if I'm saying that I want um, I want this person to bring in three hundred thousand dollars a year in new gross profit, then anything above three hundred thousand a year, I'm happy with, and I'm going to compensate them higher. Um, and I want to reward my high performers more than my low and average performers. So I don't know if I answered it or even over answered it, but if I didn't, just send me a you know send a follow up text. What activity numbers on calls, meetings, and starts do you like to see weekly or monthly? Uh, so. Um, we have the sales goals worksheet that I mentioned earlier that actually works backwards from that. Um, I can give you ranges, but what I like to do is really, I really like to go based on quantifiable numbers and on ratios. And so the sales goals worksheet allows you to start with, okay, if I want them to be at a quota of $400,000 in GP and my average bill rate is this, then I'm going to need this many people to be billing which means I'm going I'm going to need to have an, uh, this, and if if the average number of people on assignment at a company is this number, then I know that my average deal size is a certain number. So I can work all the way back 
to come up with those numbers of you need to have this many activities to have this many appointments, which puts which gets this much in your pipeline, which you close this percentage of your pipeline. So it's it's all very methodical and very quantifiable. Um, and it's something that when you sit down with a sales rep and say, this is what I want you to do, and here's why the numbers make sense, it's much, much easier for them to say, okay, well, they're, just, they're not just throwing it. They're just not just throwing numbers at the wall and seeing what sticks. And it also allows you to go back to that salesperson and say, okay, we sat down together, if they're not hitting their numbers, we sat down together and said, you need to hit these, these numbers in order for you to be successful. And at the time, you agreed that this made sense. You're not hitting the numbers. So either you now don't believe that it makes sense or you just are not doing what you need to do to hit the numbers. So it allows you to go back and have that conversation. And, of course, the first couple conversations, you're not going to be that direct with them probably, but ultimately it allows you to, once you need to get to the point of counseling anybody, if you do, it makes it easier. So, like I said, I'll get that sales goals worksheet to Meg or if somebody wants to just send me an email they can, uh, and I'll get it to you. I have a follow-up on that gross profit question. Okay. Um, if, if a candidate brings in a 400000 in gross profit per year, should they be at 100000 total comp? Um, I think that's a reasonable number, yes. Um, I think that that's... Uh, so there's a rule of thumb that I that I work with my clients on, and that, that past companies we did as well, is um, your you should shoot for your total comp for your team to be about 40% of your gross profit. So you're talking about the sales rep bringing in 400,000 would be at about 25%. Um, so you're well below that 40%, and the, and you've got to take into account the other expenses, the other, um, you know, the recruiters' costs and, and managers and those types of costs. So, yeah, I, I would say that that's a, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. If they got to about, um, uh, if they got to about 400, you could have them be about 100. Yeah. Do you think division managers should be producers or only manage the team? Uh, that's, real, boy, these are all good questions. Um, it depends on their scope. Uh, it depends on how big their sales team is. I would say if they have less than um, a half a dozen sales reps, then yes, they probably should be producers. Uh, once you get to be more more than six or seven producer or six or seven salespeople, then their their focus should be helping their salespeople sell more business, not going out and selling business on their own. You, you have to be very careful about making a sales director or producer because um, depending on how you incent them and how you manage them and how they're accountable, they, you run the risk of them really focusing on producing rather than helping your sales reps be as good as they can be. And I, have, I would rather have a sales director that is working with the team all the time and is helping them be 20, 25% more productive because they're going on calls with them, they're helping them with presentations and proposals, they're strategizing with them about how to move deals along, they're holding them accountable by having weekly meetings and having them turn in reports to them, and, and they're looking in the system and, and making sure that people are, are entering in the information and they're doing uh, analysis of that. Uh, I'd rather have them do that. Um, so by the time that you have five or six people working under you, that, that's just about a full-time job. If you have two or three, um, then then yeah, you'd have them have some probably have some numbers as well. What should we say when reaching out to the passive candidate? So, uh, oh, good question. So, um, you know, when you're reaching out to a passive candidate, um, there's a couple different ways you can go. That you can if um, uh, you know, you can reach out to them directly and say, uh, so let's say you're doing it through LinkedIn and you send them an in-mail. You can do it by saying, um, you know, I, I looked at your profile and I was very impressed. You were exactly the type of person that I would be interested in talking to. Um, we have this 
type of opportunity. This is what's so great about us and the opportunity. We'd love to talk to you about it. Um, you can take that approach. Um, the problem is, is that there's a couple problems with it. it. Sometimes it's very effective, sometimes it's not. The, the, when it's not effective, it's because of one of a couple things. Um, one is that many times their LinkedIn account is tied to their office, their company email, and it can scare them off a little bit. They can get a little bit paranoid, you know, if they work for a place that maybe they, they're worried about them checking emails, those things, they will intentionally not do anything with that so that they can always deny, hey, I, that guy sent it to me, but I didn't do anything. So what we found, um, well, the other, the other thing is, too, we found that um, the um, people who are just out of school for a couple of years, um, tend to, we tend to have a lower response rate with them because I don't think they understand the networking piece of it, uh, and they, they tend to be um, a little more hands-off, standoffish, or, or a little more unsure about it just because they're, they're newer, I think, to the industry, and I, you probably could have a whole generational discussion around it too. But um, we also find that we get a lot more in-mail declines uh, for people who are just in the industry or just in the workforce for a couple of years. Uh, the way we typically will approach them is we say, you know, we're networking for a position. Um, we're looking for somebody. This is how great of an opportunity it is. If you know of anybody, or if you yourself might be interested in it would love to talk to you or get a referral. Um, what we found is we get a better response from that because th now they don't, they're not uncomfortable responding back to us. And what we'll see a lot of times is they'll respond back to us and they'll say, I think I know somebody, can you tell me more about it? Or, um, you know, uh, I, can I call you? I think I have somebody that would be interested. And of course it turns out to be them over half of the time, but they just don't want to put that in an email, ba email response back. So um, that's a long-winded answer to that question, but that's that's how I would do it. All right, um, we we got through the the questions, and if there are additional questions, um, Tom's information is on the slide, um, and you can reach out to him directly. Um, there, a poll has been opened, so please take a moment to fill that out. I'd like to thank our participants in today's webinar, as well as Tom, for sharing his knowledge of hiring better salespeople. The recording of this webinar will be available on our website at tricom.com under resources backslash industry insider webinars. Thank you again for your participation today, and watch for information on our next webinar session, July 23rd, presented by Wintrust Wealth Management best practices and trends to manage a qualified retirement plan. Thank you again.